Now, David Sokol was a candidate to succeed Warren Buffett as the head of Berkshire Hathaway until he resigned yesterday. Now his involvement with Berkshire takeover target Lubrizol is being looked at very closely. Sokol purchased about 96,000 shares of the chemical maker before he proposed that Buffett buy the company, but after Citigroup proposed that he do just that. Lawyers at the Securities and Exchange Commission are now apparently discussing the case. Joining me now is Alan Horwich, a securities law professor at Northwestern University School of Law. For more than 30 years, he has represented corporations, financial institutions, and investors in cases just like this. Alan, thanks for joining us. Glad let me ask, let me ask first of all a question that uh, Warren Buffett seems to pose himself, or uh, that he seems to answer, I should say, himself. How important is the appearance of legality versus actually doing something uh, illegal or illegal? Well, the appearance is always troublesome, but this is a highly technical area depending upon the specific facts. And so what might uh, rub some people the wrong way is not necessarily illegal. What does this look like to you here? And, and, and let me just go through the timeline as I understand it. Uh, Citigroup proposed a number of companies to Mr. Sokol as possible uh, takeover targets for Berkshire. He then looked into Lubrizol, bought shares, sold them, bought shares again. And when he had gotten 96,000 or so, he went then to Warren Buffett and suggested uh, that Berkshire buy the company. Buffett first said no. Sokol went to dinner with the CEO of Lubrizol, went back to Buffett and then changed his mind. And then, of course, the $9 billion offer. Does that sound legal to you? I don't see a specific problem with that. Uh, it, it appears from the facts that have come out so far that at, at the time that he made the purchase, the larger purchase as well as the earlier one, uh, there was no serious consideration on the part of Berkshire Hathaway to make an acquisition. So there was no material non-public information that he had, uh, that uh, uh, Sokol had, uh, that, he, that he possessed at the time that he made his purchase. So I don't see that based on the facts we have to date as being a violation of what is technically called the misappropriation theory of insider trading. And this is because why he because he's not on the board of directors at Berkshire Hathaway, because he's not one of the people that actually makes the decision to buy the company, because clearly uh, he bought shares of the company and then suggested that Berkshire buy it. No, his status in the company would not be significant for this analysis. The key point is whether uh, the negotiations or, for that matter, the consideration of a possible acquisition of Lubrizol had reached a level where it was material information at the time he purchased the shares. From the timeline that we have, it appears that there was no serious consideration by the management of Berkshire, uh, let alone the board of directors, of pursuing that acquisition at the time Sokol made the purchase, and therefore it was not material information when he decided to make the purchase for his own account. One of the things, Alan, that uh, spread around the media like wildfire this morning was the city briefing. And that was uh, that the bank had a list of possible potential acquisition targets that it shared with Mr. Sokol long before he made a purchase uh, of the Lubrizol shares. Doesn't that concern you? I mean, if they say, hey, here's some, some companies that you could possibly buy, and then he takes a look and says, okay, I'll pick out some shares from this and then try and get Warren to purchase it, that doesn't look good. Well, there are a number of factors here. The first one is that I'm assuming uh, that Citi did not have any inside information from Lubrizol that they included in this presentation, which they then made available to Sokol that influenced his purchase. I'm setting that aside because we have no information that suggests that. Uh, at the point uh, of this presentation, it sounds like there were an array of companies that were being suggested as possible companies to look at, and, and most cases would suggest that, that at that stage the information is not material. Now, he did make the purchase, apparently relying in part upon the recommendations or the assessment of Citi that these were attractive targets, and it does give me a little bit of pause that he's, in a sense, relying or using information that might have been accessible only to Berkshire because of its relationship with Citi city in terms of this investment advice, but, but I don't think that's a legal question. I think that's, again, sort of an appearance question. So all you have here, as I understand the facts, is an array of potential targets. And, and another fact that I think is very important here is that at the time that Sokol made the recommendation to Mr. Buffett to consider making a purchase, uh, the facts that we're given uh, tell us that Sokol disclosed to Warren Buffett that he had made this purchase, that he was an owner of the shares. If he had not 
not disclosed to Mr. Buffett at the time he made that recommendation, that would be troublesome because he would have had a conflict of interest at that point that was undisclosed. Got it. All right. Hey, Alan, we appreciate you taking time out of your day for us. Alan Horwich uh, there talking about the Berkshire Hathaway story. We'll